it came down to this. My boss gave me an ultimatum. Look, David, either you can talk like a girl and bring your numbers up, or we're going to have to let you go. I'm sorry. I laughed because I had no idea how I could ever do a convincing female voice for my job as a phone sex operator. In 1988, I'm 22 years old. I'd been in San Diego maybe a month when I went on an interview to be a phone sex operator. The month before, I'd left New York City uh, with maybe a little bit of community college, really having no idea what I wanted to do with this phase of my life. The only constant was I looked like I, looked like I was auditioning for the Ramones. Hair in my eyes, holes in my jeans, left me with little job options. These are my options for work, washing dishes, working in a record store, or maybe, maybe the exciting world of telemarketing. <laughs> and quite honestly, using the word sir or ma'am in any job just never appealed to me. No brainer, I opted for the phone job, the phone sex position job. Now please understand that this job didn't require me to audition with a sexy monologue. What happened was they asked me if I could work graveyard shifts, and I said, yeah, you betcha. I was hired. <laughs> Plus, there's no drug test. <laughs> the, company, the company ran these late-night television ads. There are these videos of blonde, buxom young ladies talking to each other on the phone. They're playing spin the bottle while drinking champagne. The woman, the woman in the voiceover said, me and my friends, <laughs> we're looking to speak with exciting men. The calls are like four bucks for three minutes of nonsense. So it was my duty as the operator to initiate exciting, fun, and of course, misleading conversation. The callers, well, the callers are mostly guys, of course, and me, well, I'm a guy, and I'm the only guy that works there, the only guy that works there. So I dug down deep, real deep, into my job faking skills. We all have them. And I came up with this smoky, kind of sexy drawl of this girl, right? Actually making me sound kind of somewhat believable at 2 a.m. <laughs> now, what I, what I learned, what I picked up from the girls I work with was... These other girls in the office I worked with, they, they could speak to these hordes of men without ever really having to get sexual. I mean, a lot of these calls were just like a bunch of first dates, talking about uh, your favorite TV shows, what kind of music do you like, um, where you live, how tall you are. And occasionally some guy would call in to tell you how swollen his balls were. Now, for every 25 guys that, that were phoning in, there were actually a few girls calling in, a few real girls, and, and a couple of those few girls were actually calling back to talk to me, to me. Now, all this is new to me because um, uh, coming of age, I suffered from a really acute low, low, self, low self-esteem. Um, I had bad skin, awkward posture, uh, just this really gangly looking kid, just felt that way entirely. Um, I couldn't play sports, I don't even understand sports. So, I, you know, for a long time I felt shunned by anyone that was remotely popular, especially girls. I grew my hair long and I, and I, and I played punk rock. Now, in this job for my regular voice, for my regular male voice, my moniker was Joey. This is after Joey Ramone, my childhood idol, of course. And with, the attention, and with the attention I was getting with these girls, I was Joey Ramone. I mean, I'm, I'm the unlikely desirable rock star. I, I went from having low self-esteem and absolutely no clue how to talk to any girls, period, to talking about girls about anything and everything every night for minimum wage. It was awesome. Now, sometimes, sometimes these girls they even asked me to meet them in person so we could do more than just talk. But despite the rosy self-descriptions they gave me, I had no delusions. I'm pretty confident that 
if I met these girls in person, they were going to be just like me. Shitty, shitty liars. <laughs> but even besides that, the office, the office had one rule, one single rule that we were to abide by, and that was do not ever, do not ever under any circumstances give out the company address, the location of the office. Don't ever do that. Don't do it. <laughs> ever. <laughs> Everything else was fair game as long as we didn't we as long as we didn't break this rule. It was in a frame sign on every single desk in this shitty office. Now, to meet any of these people in real life would be sort of like a, a phone sex jihad anyway, so now, I, I got to tell you, I did, I did come to embrace this job. It was, like, um, it was like I was this radio personality, and people would call in just to listen to me speak. And it got to be like it was um, an apron that I would just take on and off when it was time to go to work. So it was easy for me, and I, I really enjoyed it. Now, my, for my female voice, my female voice, I was Jennifer. This was after my pet cat, Jenny. <laughs> Jennifer looked just like me at the time. She's tall. She's maybe 5'8", five, 5'9", five, without her heels on. <laughs> She's got dark hair. She's got blue eyes. But unlike me, of course, her breasts are a little bit bigger. Maybe a B or a C cup, right? And now I, I quickly made Jennifer, um, I made her character very attracted to women because I could, it just made, made it easier for me to relate to. Now, as her voice may have suggested, she wasn't exactly a prom queen. <laughs> Far from a prom queen. Now, my biggest fan, or I should say Jennifer's biggest fan, was a guy named Todd. Whenever Todd called, he... Whenever he called and I answered as Joey, Todd made it immediately clear to me that he thought I was a faggot. These were his exact words. I don't like you, Joey, because you're a faggot. <laughs> Todd would call, this guy would call in incessantly, especially on the weekend. He had horrible taste in everything. He was into bands like Styx and Toto. He even loved movies with Chuck Norris for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> His role model, Hulk Hogan, of course. One time he asked me out on a date to go to a concert to see Huey Lewis and the News <laughs> with special guest Winger. I politely refused. Now, I think I think that we've all known guys just like Todd in our lives. Now, for me, Todd was the guy in elementary school who, um, he never picked me for dodgeball. Todd was the same guy in junior high school that would steal my lunch out of my locker and then eat it right in front of me. Todd was also the guy that nailed me in the head with a milk carton tossed out of his Camaro. So chatting with him every night when he called in the phone sex line I worked at, this was a goddamn miracle. <laughs> now, sometimes just to rile Todd up, just to rile him up, I would use my joy voice to talk to Todd about how great an ass Jennifer had. <laughs> One time I said, Todd, Jennifer can't come to the phone right now. She's in the, she's in the office bathroom taking a giant shit. Now, this pissed Todd off to, to no end because um, the one thing about Todd was he never crossed the line of indecency or there was never much mention of sexual talk with Todd, which was great for me because he was locked in the friend zone. <laughs> it's perfect. Now, I got used to Todd, calling, to Todd calling me a faggot all the time because in Todd's world, in Todd's world, the worst thing you could be or be called was gay. And all this made it all the more exciting for me to tell Todd the truth about Jennifer, about Joey, and about me. 
So like clockwork, Todd called in on Friday night. I answered as Joey. Yeah, right, that's bullshit, Todd insisted. Just let me talk to Jenny already. That's what I want to talk to you about, Todd. <laughs> Todd, there, there is no Jennifer. It's been me you've, you've been talking to the whole time in this fake made-up voice I came up with to have guys like you keep spending their money, and as far as you know, nothing personal. <laughs> and then, in my Jennifer voice, I greeted him the same way, the same way I did every time he called. Oh, hello, Todd. <laughs> the, line, the line went quiet for a minute. Then I heard Todd say, I ain't no faggot. And he hung up. <laughs> there was a girl that would call in. This girl I would talk to, she would call in pretty regularly and always about, we would talk about anything and everything. Her name was Sarah. Now, I could tell Sarah was different from the other girls that called in. It was how she sold herself in, her, in our conversations. She, she really wasn't interested in, in me telling her a bunch of nice guy stuff about how cute she sounded, or I just sensed that her whole life she was just the guys telling her how attractive she was. She never needed to embellish herself. It was only when I started to say things to her like, you sound pretty desperate, or why are you spending all your money to talk to a bunch of weirdos, that she responded, I just want to talk to you, Joey. Now I'm floored. I mean, I started to envision Sarah as that girl next door, the girl that never talked to me, that real popular girl in high school. Uh, yeah, she was a cheerleader. And yes, she went to her own prom. And um, she was even married. She married the guy that she went to the prom with. But she made it clear that she, she wasn't desperate. She was never desperate sounding. She was bored, and she was looking for kicks. And she was right. So after too many months and so much dirty talk, she finally said, she said, well, we should just meet and fuck already. <laughs> Again, she was right. We should. She was the exception to the kind of girls that normally called in, and, and she would be the exception. She's going to be the exception to the one to the one office rule. I told her to go to the AMPM, the one on Euclid Avenue. Call the office line from the payphone, and from the second story office window, I could see the payphone under the street light. This is this is it. Twenty minutes later. The private line rang in the office. It was Sarah. Looking out my office window, I saw that she was everything, everything she had described to me. Again, the perfect girl next door type. Just awesome. So in my best, in my best ransom voice, I said, go in the store, grab some wine coolers, and then meet me in the parking lot. <laughs> I walked with her into the secret office. It was a real dump. Shittier than this, actually. <laughs> we, we quickly got past our, our, our overdue in-person introduction and maybe, maybe a half a wine cool later, we consummated what we had been talking about for months. And it occurred to me that as long as I had her there and I was at work, I had to put this to good use and give the callers their due. I handed her the receiver, and I let her have her breathing fill in for exciting fun. I remember thinking, man, I can't believe I fucking work here. <laughs> Later that morning, maybe an hour earlier than usual, I heard the office door unlock. It all happened in slow motion. My boss, she spied the trail of clothes littering the office carpet, the empty wine coolers. The gig was up. So trying to recover my pants, I knew I'd be fired. 
I was totally okay with this, totally okay with it. I think I'd earned my retirement having done everything I could ever hope to get away with in this job. <laughs> now, some jobs have perks like uh, Hawaiian shirt day or <laughs> free pizza lunch Fridays, or taco Tuesday, whatever. The perk here, the perk here in this job was doing what every human being wanted to do. I had lost, I had lost my fear of rejection. Yeah, I, I had broken the golden rule. And um, besides our location, the real secret, the real secret here to this operation was that we were all just lonely people. Lonely people too, people that needed somebody to tell us that we're funny, that we sounded cute, that we seem clever, right? Sure, the callers, they're paying for that service, but me, I was looking for it too. I might have been getting paid to do it, but I'm just as desperate as Todd. <laughs>